Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Ryan Nadell, and this is going to be an interesting episode about growing your company from five million to eighty million in gross revenue. Ryan is the CEO of Mit Forty Five, which is an e-commerce brand that sold nearly seventy-five million dollars worth of Kratom products in 2022, and he will explain for you what that is in a little bit. He's also the president and CEO of South Sea Ventures, a private equity fund, and he sits on the board of directors for several other companies. He's also helped with the acquisition or exit of more than 11 companies while seeing their collective revenue surpass more than $237 million. He has successfully tripled the revenue of more than five companies in under two and a half years, adding an extra $950 million in valuation to these companies. Uh, if I say any more, you'll stop believing me, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Ryan. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone, everyone a little bit more about you uh, and MIT45 and what the hell a Kratom is? Yeah, Sean, thanks for having me first and foremost. I love I love what my team has put together for for that beautiful intro. It makes me sound larger than life. And what it really comes down to is I'm, I'm just a normal guy from Midwest, right? And it's not to downplay myself. I don't have a fancy MBA from a prestigious Ivy League university. I live in Columbus, Ohio, kind of born and raised live my entire life in different parts of Ohio. And a lot of my success has been on the backside of my own shortcomings, right? Where went to college for mechanical engineering, not because I wanted to be some fancy engineer, but because math and science were just very simple for me. And it was a little the path of least resistance. I would love to say I had some huge aspiration in going to college. My aspiration was to get a degree in the simplest fashion possible. And when you say engineering, people are like, that's, that's ludicrous. But it's just how my brain works, right? Math and science, again, we're, we're second nature. And so that's allowed me and afforded me a luxury in my professional career of being able to look at things and laughingly reverse engineer the success that I seek, right? So it's, if I want to be a $100 million a year business, what are all the things that would have to happen in a rough sequential order to help support that? And part of any business's growth is the unknown. I think we, you and I could probably agree with knowing a little bit about your background, like the, the path is crystal clear until you start taking some of those first steps. And then for me, I, I've realized every once in a while that crystal clear path is, is really a hall full of mirrors. And I'm have to navigate this clear path, and I, you know, searching around on the ground for where the actual path is, versus what I thought I saw, which led led me into this world shot of from selling a couple of businesses. So I sold a, a host a web hosting company to a subsidiary of GoDaddy about nine years ago, jumped into high risk merchant processing that I thought, I, I thought at 29, I had the Midas touch. I'm 38 right now. I found by 30, just about 31, I didn't have the Midas touch. And like everything I was touching was turning to coal versus gold. So the, the high risk merchant processing company I started was an abysmal failure. All the money I had, had made from the exit of the hosting company was all gone. Run on properties in foreclosure, truck got repossessed. I'll say a negative net worth of, you know, 40 to 60 grand. Like really, I'll say pretty low. Started a custom clothing company. Was fortunate enough to learn a lot about wool and haberdashery. Bought into a manufacturing facility in England. Helped grow that. And I did a, an owner finance deal to my head of sales after, after two year time period. Jumped into CBD before people knew what CBD was. And not because I was passionate about CBD. Really, I saw the right place at the right time. I saw that Google search search volume was increasing for CBD. There wasn't a lot of really powerful direct-to-consumer brands at that point. So created a direct-to-consumer only brand and grew that from 16 to 18 and sold that to a private equity group out of Pittsburgh, uh, December of 2018. Then eventually ended up consulting for the company I'm now CEO of, a company called MIT45, which um, imports, manufactures, and distributes uh, an indigenous leaf to Indonesia and Thailand called Kratom. And if you haven't heard of Kratom, I, it's not a big surprise to me. Almost no one has heard of Kratom. If you look at anecdotal third-party research, less than 2% of the populace has ever tried it before. So a pretty low, low amount of people have heard of it. But what Kratom does, if you take uh, conversively, right? I'm not allowed to say there's any sort of structural claim. So there's all types of things that the FDA is always looking for and, and FTC and everybody else. So I'm saying if... If you interviewed someone that has tried Kratom, they would say more than likely, if you take a little bit, it gives you focus, it gives you clarity, it gives you energy, essentially like a, an organic nootropic type of product. If you take a lot of it, 
it has the opposite effect. It's more of a sedative, a muscle relaxing type of feel. And the, the downside of it, right, let's make sure we paint the entire picture, is it works on your opioid receptors. So you have the type 1 receptors or A receptors, which is what Oxycontin, heroin, some really hard drugs work on the type A receptors. And Kratom works on the type B receptors. So Big Pharma doesn't like Kratom because it helps people get off of opioid addiction. It's, it's got a lot of really positive. It's been said to have the ability to help people get off opioids. A lot of anecdotal research for that. But just as easily, if you Google what is Kratom, you're going to see tons of information saying it's the worst thing ever. So it's a, it's a very polarizing product. Half the populace says, man, it's a panacea and it will solve every problem under the sun. It's like Windex for, for the, the Greek people in my big fat Greek wedding. You spray it on everything. It solves every problem under the sun or the opposite side, which is if you look at it, it's going to absolutely kill you. So we've been able to grow this business again. When I came around $5 million a year in annualized revenue, the numbers aren't all the way tight from last year. We're certainly north of 70 million. We'll see what we have in, in some of those reserve accounts and what things look like. But in between 70 and 75 million is where we hit for 2022. So a lot of growth from 2018 to 2022. I wonder how much of that is due to the COVID pandemic where people are just at home and they're like, oh, I just want to like feel chill or like I, I know during that time, I definitely felt a lot of anxiety, um, especially from my own business and COVID specifically, I was really anxious around getting infected and not wanting to get infected. And um, I definitely found some solace in uh, clonopin, which isn't a good, it's, it's not good to like take these kinds of things, but I was very fortunate that I was able to get some and um, it was helpful. But I, I think some people don't want to go that route. And so they looked at things like that. Um, I think cachava and, and weed were also really big purchases during that time. Um, but hey, you know, business is business. And if it's not addictive, then, you know, let's do it. E even if it is addictive, you, you look at some people, and they don't have the same moral uh, centers that some people do. And well, you know, they're being sued right now for billions of dollars and their names can't be named because of the, the agreements they've made with courts. Of course, and to, to make mention of that, just so I'm uh, painting the right picture of this product, there, there are plenty of conversations to say that Kratom could be addictive. What I look at it is, if you're someone that if you have a, one drink of alcohol, you find yourself having 12 drinks and you can't stop at just one, you might not want to try something like Kratom because if you start to feel good, you might want to feel better and you might keep trying it. But if you're someone that can can have that drink or you know you can go to the gym once, you don't have to go 12 times each day, I think you have to be able to modulate your own level of, of obsessive compulsive nature that we all have inside of us. That, that, um, that thing that makes us want to keep doing something over and over again because we feel good, it's how much self-regulation do you have on that? And so if you find yourself saying, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot of self-control, no shame in that, right? We've all, we've all got our vices, probably stay away from Kratom because it, it, it definitely has a good feeling to it. And by the nature of that, you might want to keep trying more and more and more, which there's a product in Kratom. The alkaloid is 7-hydroxy that has that, that habit forming nature to it. So we actually, in our manufacturing process, filter out as much 7-hydroxy as we possibly can. We have the lowest in the industry because we look at, we want you to have all the healthy benefits without any of the negative side effects, but it's not perfect. So enter at your own risk. Again, there's, we sell about 600,000 bottles of our, of our main product every month. So people are using it. People seem to enjoy it. Enter at your own risk. You've made a claim, so I do have to ask. Do you have lab reports or anything available publicly for people to be able to review? Because I, I've been on Amazon quite frequently for different products, as I'm sure a lot of people are. And very often, brands will make claims, and then people in the comments below that have purchased the product will go, well, you know, I ran a, a lab test on it, and actually, no, it doesn't have this thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something I think people would think about. We've taken a really aggressive stance in this, Sean, and I, I love what you're bringing up that although it's not deemed a food grade product, we've really treated it like a food grade product. So the, the leaves themselves are tested in Indonesia where they're native to, they're tested again when they land stateside, they're tested midway through our manufacturing and they're tested at the end of manufacturing. So in the grand fancy scheme of manufacturing prowess is here in the United States. That's called GMP compliance at kind of a base level. 
And so we're, we're GMP compliant as a facility, which allows it to be that if you were to buy a, a bottle of one of our products and scan the QR code on the back, it shows up on a website then where you can see the entire history of that product. You can see all the COAs that have been tested and associated with that lot number all the way through. So we would take a lot of pride in having a really transparent, um, a transparent manufacturing process. Again, our, our main product, a bottle called MIT 45, no big secret by the name of our company. It literally is vegetable glycerin, citric acid, high filtered water and Kratom. That's it. There's, there's nothing else in there. And, and our, our tests support that all the way through. So would love it. If you're listening and you buy a bottle, get a third party test done. You know, it'll only confirm what I'm sharing now. You mentioned GMP and COA. What do those mean? COA is certificate of analysis. That's something that to me, any, anything you put in your body, I believe you should be able to find somewhere the certificate of analysis that a third party has reviewed the efficacy of, of what the product is and what's in it. Now, certainly supplements in the United States kind of work backwards where you can create a supplement. You and I, Sean, can create a supplement together. We don't have to have it tested. We can take it to market. We can manufacture it. We can say it solves everything under the sun. And until the FDA or FTC pushes us to be able to back up our, our claims, we can keep conducting business. So you don't actually have to, on a supplement, have the certificate of analysis done beforehand. You can just kind of wing it, which what makes the supplement world so scary. Something like on Amazon, where you could create a product, make big claims, throw it on Amazon, sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth, knowing you've never done any sort of testing. Unfortunately, that's the way the supplement world works. Food's a little bit different, right? Food, you do have to test before going to market and have the certificate of analysis. So that's that's the COA side of things. The GMP ends up being um, essentially the, I forget the exact acronym, but it's the standardization of manufacturing principles that state the fact that your facility is clean, orderly, up to date, following best practices as, as arrived to by the FDA. The GMP in your situation is saying that the Indonesian factory is following it or just yours in the US? Just ours in the US. And we're in the process of working with the Indonesian government to help have them follow the same FDA guidelines. And it's our, we're operating from that same level in Indonesia. But I can't make that same claim because a GMP facility doesn't exist over there. What I can say is, and I'm sitting at my office desk right now as you and I are having a conversation, if I were to drop a bite of food on my desk, my production facility floor is more hygienic and more clean right now in this moment in the middle of the day than my desk is. I mean, the, the, the GMP requirements are very, very high. So you know, there's no external contaminants. We have uh, HEPA filtration systems everywhere. There's hair nets, there's gloves, there's shoe coverings, there's uh, clean hygienic um, smocks and, and the accoutrements that people have to wear just to enter the production facility. And if they ever leave the production facility for a break or you know whatever whatever need be, they have to go through that whole process once again before they're allowed back in. So it's really, really a clean and orderly environment where we take a lot of pride that if at any moment somebody could stop by and we give you a tour of our facility and it's it's really sterile. I mean, it, it feels almost cold, right? It's not an inviting place, but it is a very safe and well thought out environment. There was a time when I was in Shenzhen, China, where I was working with a British guy who had a business that provided uh, meals in mass to schools and uh, businesses where they had to be able to serve, I think it was like 5,000 meals a day or maybe 5,000 people per meal. I, well, I can't remember, but it was like they were only targeting larger um, institutions. And I was helping them to get connected to uh, a, uh, a Chinese, well, a Taiwanese uh, manufacturer that had a, a large uh, base in Shenzhen. And I remember um, arranging a tour for the board of directors for the Taiwanese manufacturer uh, with one of their, uh, like, I guess you would call it like a food production hub. And it was very sterile. So I, I definitely understand uh, that. It was really cool. Unfortunately, I couldn't take any video or anything, but it was a, a very interesting experience to say the least. Well, yeah, Sean, you think about it. And it's as a consumer, there's this inherent trust that we have in the U.S., especially for a food. You know, you walk into a local grocer, you assume that if you're grabbing a bag of potato chips, let's say off the shelf, you're assuming when you open it there, it's safe to eat, right? There's a lot of trust that we have built into 
the the economy at large here in the U.S. And so I look at it, I mean, think about it logically. If one of my employees somehow got something in their hair, right, and who knows what come up with whatever could be in their hair. It doesn't matter what an ash from a cigarette that somebody else smoked and flicked as they were walking by. Well, if that level of contamination somehow ended up in something you're ingesting in your body, I'd feel, I'd feel horrible. It has nothing to even do with the, the revenue and the, the, the onset of issues that would come from that. It's you're entrusting us and our brand that you're going to consume something that we've created. It becomes my responsibility to make sure that it's a, a, an enjoyable experience free of any sort of potential hardships that could exist. So there's all these little things that until I got into this particular business, I never considered before. Like I, I didn't know anything about this five years ago. So I guess you get to go to Indonesia to inspect the facilities quite often. So I, I'm fortunate in this business that one of my partners makes that journey. He loves international travel. He loves to spend the time on the airplane. He's He loves to be over at the facility where it's not that I don't enjoy that, but there's so much going on for us stateside that it's actually better use of time for him to go over is he's he used to be the CEO. He's definitely graduated into more of the, you know, board of directors, kind of the, the founder's role. So he gets to go over there and, you know, enjoy the fruits of his labor, but doesn't have to concern himself with the day-to-day operations. Yeah. Sounds like a great job. Get, get to travel to Indonesia. So when you first started working with a company before you decided to become the CEO, or however that worked out, the company was generating about five million. What issues did you see immediately that you said this is it's it's not going to destroy the business, but it's not going to let you grow? I don't know if we have enough time on this particular show to go through all of them, but I'll certainly give you the highlights. Right. So and I've, I've seen this time and time again, even in my own businesses, it seems like the, the zero to one million dollar a year range. You can do that kind of on hustle, tenacity. You can really figure out that's really the time to figure out product market fit or market message match, however you want to look at it. You can get to that million. And then one to five is a combination of that hustle and a levels of systems and processes. And so the company had systems and processes. They were just inefficient. And perfect example of that. Back then, and, and they were at five million a year for a few years in a row. If you were someone that was buying product from us, a, a gas station, a, a convenience store chain, you speak to one of my sales professionals. My sales professional would take your order. They would physically walk back into our warehouse, give it to a fulfillment specialist. The fulfillment specialist would package your order up and ship it out. Then once it got shipped out, accounting got to know about it. So when I came in, we had 1.6 million in uncollected accounts receivable that no one even knew existed. Because you think logically, uh, really what should happen and what happens now, a salesperson takes an order, it gets sent over to accounting. We have to make sure there's no outstanding balance on their account. We have to make sure they're in good credit standing. We have to make sure they, they are who they say they are. W-9s are filled out. All the stuff that goes into conducting real business. And then it goes to fulfillment to, to be shipped out. And so just reevaluating the, the processes that customers go through and that we were operating in internally was one of the most pivotal things to start with. It wasn't, it wasn't reinventing the wheel. I would love to say, gosh, Sean, I came in, I had this magic marketing idea and poof, things just took off. No, just by analyzing what we were already doing at that point, it's okay, if we don't grow at all, we'll have an extra, essentially $2 million just by tightening up our credit process and what we do that way. And then you start to, you know, that that worked pretty well to get us from five to 10 million. I started to notice a lot of that 10 to 11 million where quite a few of the people that had got us to that point in time just quite frankly, didn't have the skill set or the drive or the ambition to get us to the next next plot, which is about twenty five million for us. the fr- The frustrating part is they were convinced they had the skill set, right? So it's that unconscious incompetence. It's like, no, no, I can absolutely do this. And so we we bring up things like you and I spoke about this. I'll say off camera, so I'll, I'll drop it on here. We, we talk about accounting, right? We had a great CFO, someone that in, in her mind was a phenomenal CFO. So I'm sitting down saying, help me understand our accounting principles, right? Help me understand what goes on. Are we FIFO or LIFO? Those acronyms being last in, first out, or first in, first out. That's how we start looking at inventory stocking, right? So what we want to run is first in, first out. 
meaning as product gets made, it gets put on the shelf and more product backfills it. We want to always ship the quote unquote oldest product to customers, right? So you're, you're always pooling from what was manufactured the longest ago, but that's only a series of weeks. And her answer to me is, well, we run a combination of those, like that you, you, you can't run a combination of LIFO and FIFO as you really get into it with gap based accounting, right? Generally accepted accounting principles. Um, you have to choose one or the other. And so that's, that started having me say, okay, well, I'm not the smartest guy in the, in the, in the business. Maybe I haven't heard of a hybrid FIFO LIFO. Help me, help me understand more. Help me understand, are we on a cash basis or accrual basis? And she said, well, we're pretty much on cash. And this is one of those moments where as you're spending time with Sean and I listening to us, it's one of the big changes that happens. If you look at you know, publicly traded companies, they're all running on an accrual based system for accounting. And all that means is I'll take my web hosting business. Someone would buy a web hosting package from me, but they'd sign up for five years when they paid five years of service. Well, in a cash based world, I'm collecting all that, all that money for those five years and I'm booking it as income in month one, but on a accrual basis, I should have taken that $300 and broke it out equally each month over 60 months because you still have to fulfill on the service for that period of time. Well, that's one of those lessons I didn't know in the hosting business when we sold it because here we are, this company running $50 million a year in revenue, but we're not really. We're earning about $12 million in revenue on an accrual basis, which takes this company I thought we were going to sell for hundreds of millions of dollars and we sell for $12 million because all of our numbers are wrong. All of our accounting was wrong. Everything was backwards. And so as I'm poking inside of our business and saying, help me understand. And she just, while she understood the principles of accrual and again, a very brilliant woman, she's like, we're never going to be able to switch to accrual. It's just not going to happen. You don't understand this business enough. And so a combination of LIFO and FIFO being one and the same and someone telling me we can't switch to, to accrual. It's just having to go through and start to say like, love you to death for all that you've done to help us get from 2 million to to 11 million. But you're not going to be on the, you're not going to be on the, the trip to 11 to 25, 11 to 50. So then it's getting into that whole firing well, which is a, a whole different principle of understanding that to me, when we hire someone, we typically see the best in them, right? We, we run them through a series of interviews. We get to know them. We check their references. And at that moment in time, they're probably the best fit for the role. Well, as businesses grow or we mature as operators, we start to see deficiencies in some of those decisions. The person probably hasn't changed. They probably haven't become worse at what they do. Just the requirements have changed or our internal skills have changed. And so when that happens to me, instead of saying, okay, like you're you're fired, it's really acknowledging it and saying, look, you've done everything that we've asked you to do, but the role has changed. The responsibilities have changed. I've changed. And so it's not your fault. You've done everything right. But as we go forward, we're going to be going in a different direction. And I want to help you find that place to land for yourself. I want to open up my Rolodex. I want to open up any connection I have because your skills were amazing from two to 11. And I really think you can add value. And in a way to help you do that, I'm going to give you a really good severance package because you didn't do anything wrong. And it really changes that feeling of how we terminate someone that really hasn't done something wrong, right? This this person didn't steal from us. They, They didn't try to harm the business. She cared about the business a tremendous amount, but her skills weren't there. So instead of penalizing people for that, I just want to fire them graciously, right? It's just a different way to look at it. I always look at it as my job as the CEO of a company is to make sure I have the best people and to understand what each employee's goals are in their career. And if they're not growing in a way that makes sense for them, and I can't help them any further, then it probably doesn't make sense to continue working together because they're probably not excited anymore and I'm not getting the best out of them. So there's no point in continuing to work together. And so hopefully then I can help them to further their career goals by, you know, giving them the freedom to go and find a new opportunity that'll challenge them in that that way. I love it. Couldn't agree more. It also sounds a lot better than fire. (laughs) That's true. That's, That's very true. So, so that's a really good example of someone that you found who was good for the business, but not uh, continuing to be great for the business. Um, and I think those are two really important levers you pulled on 
that enabled you to get to the next level. How how did you handle that transition? Did you take over the CFO position for yourself? Did you find someone immediately or did it take months to find someone? Like how, how did you handle that? And what was the specific result of changing out the CFO? I certainly didn't jump in. I didn't roll up my sleeves and I, I wouldn't have been capable of it. At that moment, I didn't have the level of training specifically for accounting, but what it did create was an acknowledgement that I didn't have that level of training. So I then went out and got that level of training, right? It was Look, if that ever happens again, I don't need to be the CFO. I don't have any aspirations or delusions of grandeur that would say I'm a qualified CFO. But if our back was against the wall and there was nobody else there and business had to continue, I, I need somebody. I needed to have the skill set to at least step in so the, the ship wasn't taking on water. Fortunately, in the accounting department, we had a, a, a level of additional staff. Right? We had a controller in place. We had accounts payable and accounts receivable. We had a, a generalized clerk. So when the when the CFO stepped away, when she transitioned out, the controller stepped into the, the role for a moment, right, just for a series of a week or two, until her replacement came in. And her replacement, um, she'd been through a lot, right? She, had, she was a part of Purple, the mattress company, and their IPO, and some things that went on that way. So I've really become very intentional with looking for people that have traversed the next season that we're stepping into. As I'm hiring those key roles, I don't... I'm. I think that's another one of the changes, right? From as I'm as I went from 25 to, to 50 million, it's starting to look for people that have already been past where we're going to. It's not allowing people to necessarily, especially in, in that C-suite roles, not have them learn on the job, right? I need people that have already been past that because I want to shorten down the time that it takes for us to grow. And really hiring very, very brilliant people for all of the C-suite roles and then empowering them to do the same. It's been a big shift from that 25 or 30 up to the 75 or so we're going to hit this year or for 2022. That's a really big driver. So that CFO was the first domino that fell. She was the first one that came in that had this plethora of experience, not only in the, the CFO chair, but really even in a COO chair. So she understood not only the finance side of things, but also how that corresponds with operations. And those two to me, as I look at businesses are so intertwined, right? I mean, how do you how do you start looking at finance without looking at operations and vice versa? It's like they're they're opposite sides of the same coin. And so having someone with that skill set was a catalyst in our in our future success. So was that the most important change you made or the most important change I made in that moment? Absolutely. But right, it's it's a cascading effect to me. You make that decision, then you start looking back and saying, okay, now. Now I have a higher skill set person in this role. It's it's shining a light on all the deficiencies everywhere else. So it's like, all right, now I need to go hire a better chief revenue officer. I need to go hire a better chief marketing officer. I need to hire a better chief operations officer to help bolster those things up. And those were those were pretty pivotal. Another pivotal part, Sean, was switching our corporation or switching our LLC into a C Corp, really massaging some of the things that way and doing stock issuance to our entire team. So when you come on board with us, you're actually getting shares in, in the company itself. I mean, our, our vision right now is certainly to be one of the first public, if not the first publicly traded Kratom company in the world. And our revenue is supporting that. Our growth is supporting that. There'll be some uniqueness to figure out what exchange to go to. There's some hurdles that we still have to hop over. But there's something that changes when you show somebody they're an actual owner of the business and that the decisions they're making are affecting the bottom line, which then affects their their distribution, their dividend, in accordance to the number of shares they have. So that was a really, again, as I start looking, what's taking us from that that 30, 40 up to that 75, it's really getting cultural buy-in from laughingly the janitor all the way up to me. If we were to call the janitor right now and say, like, what are our core values? They should be able to share what our core values are and not share it like begrudgingly with Oh gosh, let me go look at the plaque on the wall. It should be, no, no, it, it's, it's candor, it's honesty, it's forward facing, it's intelligence, right? They should, because they're, they're living and breathing it because they understand how that ripples through the entire organization and everybody that interacts with it. What was the, the next kind of revenue mark where you felt stuck from, from after that 10, after you replaced the CFO? So from 10, the next place we landed was 25. Right. And that didn't feel stuck. That felt like we couldn't get enough done in the right amount of time. And when I say that we couldn't get enough done to me, as we have people from a previous season that are involved in the business, 
they're unconsciously incompetent in their own right, right? They don't know what they don't know. So I started having conversation with the sales manager about right, what are the number of turns that an average customer is going through? How are you increasing average order value? What's the throughput penetration on you know these three SKUs? And it looks as though I'm speaking a foreign language to that person. And it's not because they're unintelligent, but they were they were brilliant and incredible to get from five to 20 to 25, whatever the number was. But knowing that from 25 to 50, these, these details have to start being on the forefront. We can't keep doing more of what we've been doing, expecting to get massively different results. And so by asking those questions and seeing like, okay, he doesn't quite know what I'm talking about. I mean, he gets it conceptual, but we have no idea how to impact those. It's okay. On one side, I can pay for his training, which is part of our corporate culture. Every employee gets 1250 bucks a quarter to invest as they see fit into continuing education to better their skill set. But that's only so efficient. It's better for me to say to that individual, I, you're not fired. You're doing a great job. But I need to bring somebody in for you to learn from. I need to bring somebody in and was able to go to market and find uh, the person that was in charge of sales for DC shoes. As they went from 50 million to 500 million, they had one sales director who's now our sales director. So he's been through international commerce before. He's been through all these things I'm suggesting. He's been through, you know, how do you really market and and create an environment around your brand inside of a retail storefront? Because Sean, out of the 70, I'll say 75 million this year in revenue, 54 million of that is B2B for us. The majority of our revenue is still selling to you who owns five smoke shops across the country. And so how do we help you sell incrementally more and shorten down your reorder rate so that your timing, you're never, you're never without product on the shelf and showing somebody if you're without product for three days over the course of the year, that's probably two additional turns, which is probably costing you an extra, I'll make it up $5,000 a year, which doesn't sound like much, but if we just help you manage your inventory levels, you're not doing anything more. You're not working harder to make the extra five grand. You're just working slightly smarter. So we started bringing a level of, um, tracking accountability technology to help impact the points that were really going to make a difference in the business. Sounds like that guy was extremely important. He was, he was, but Sean, as we go through all that, now we've at the same time as we cross from that 25 into the 50 range, we've now out, we can't produce as much product as the marketplace is demanding from us. So I'm like, okay, now I have to figure out a manufacturing solution. So now I have to go and buy two manufacturing facilities. I can use them as co-packers. Or I can jump in and say, look, let's look at your net margin. Let me take some of the M&A experience I have. What if we just buy you? And so I bought two separate facilities, which are the GMP compliant facilities now, because it was just such a shorter barrier to entry. They were already compliant. I could buy them and backfill them. And then I had a revenue positive way to, to manufacture my own product at scale. And so it's like, it, laughingly, every new level has a new devil. It's like, okay, you solved that problem. You now have manufacturing. Now it's like, well, shoot, we have all this dormant time on our production lines. Now I need my sales guys to go out and sell more because we're not maximizing the floor footprint of the manufacturer, like the equipment itself. We just have, you never want dormant equipment in a factory. And so then you get new salespeople and they start ramping up sales. Now all of a sudden operations is in turmoil because now there's six new customers coming in and where do you put the product and how do you manage supply chain to support those products? And then you solve that. And then you're back to the marketing side. Well, how do we go out and get more customers? Because now we have another shift. So I look at business very simply. You, I, there's only four aspects that I look at business. I think you would say there's, there might be five. It's marketing, operations, sales, and service. And I look at operations and finances, one and the same. So you call it numbers, you call it whatever you want to. But no sooner, if you look at four, each one of those is one of four legs on a table. Well, you make one leg a little taller, one leg a little shorter, the table starts wobbling. So you got to go back around and incrementally sure up each one of those legs. And so the goal is to keep growing them kind of simultaneously, which sounds easy in principle, but you get it. Certainly when you're out there in the field in the thick of things, man, you get that, that linear focus on one aspect of the business. And all of a sudden the other three start to go to the wayside a little bit, or just don't grow as quickly or efficiently, which is then the next big transition, Sean is from that 50 to the 75 or wherever we'll be this, this past year has been decentralizing as much as I possibly can. They're taking a, a page out of Jeff Bezos' book with type one and type two decisions. Type one decisions are decisions you really can't come back from, right? So 
if you send credit terms to the wrong people, you know, pricing, some things that it would drastically affect the business if those decisions are wrong. There's only five or six for our company. Type two decisions are like that two-way door. You walk through it, you don't like what's on the other side, you just walk right back out. Well, as the business has grown, most of the decisions kept funneling up to me. I started looking around after a couple of 80 hour weeks and like, why am I making the decision on what the marketing flyer needs to say? I have a CMO for that. And so pushing back down and decentralizing and empowering everyone that supports the mission, vision, value of the company to make decisions. And just to, to own the fact that an 80% success rate in making decisions puts you as a world-class decision maker, right? Everybody that, has that fear of, I got to be right 100% of the time. You might be right 100% of the time, time, Sean, but I'm nowhere close to that personally. Like it's it's the iteration. It's the decision-making quickly to then get that input to say, okay, I thought that was the right path, but now we need to course correct a little bit. We need to go a slightly different direction. And so that's been one of the big things from that 50 to the, the mid-70s has been empowering the people that support me to own more of the footprint, right? The I want to I want to really be the chief impediment remover where the C-suite around me they get stuck somewhere and I have the ability to come in and knock down a wall for them, but then they have to keep, you know, taking that, taking that footprint. They have to keep driving forth. I think my team from my past startup would probably say I was wrong at least half the time. Sounds about right. If I'm only right half the time, that's still pretty good odds. Those are great odds. I would spend quite a bit of time being told why my thought process was wrong or why this is wrong or why I'm, I don't have enough information to make that decision and I should leave it to them to make the decisions and... <laughs> that's one of the things to me of being a founder, being a CFO or being a CEO, you start to become accustomed to making decisions without all the information. And that's that dichotomy back and forth to me is for type one decisions, we might have eight weeks to, to do all the data compiling to decide what is the absolute best decision. But I'll tell you when we were $10 million a year, it's like we were putting out fires every other day. There wasn't time to, to come up with an eight week hypothesis on what might happen if we made a decision. It's like, you look at the day that's in front of you, you might ask one or two people, then you just freaking go knowing that half the time you're going to have to retread your steps and go a slightly different direction. But to me, that's the fun of that 10 to 25 million is, is that your back's not really against the wall because the business is cash flowing positively, but at times it feels like it's, it's us against the world, right? You're just making those decisions and iterating real time. Yeah. I definitely don't miss any of this. Like, but listening to you talk about it, I get excited because I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it would be awesome to like, to go through this. I've, I've talked to so many people that have done things like this. Uh, although I would say the average one gets to like 25, 30 in their business. Um, cause they're not doing e-commerce. So it's a little bit harder to scale service side. Um, so like I've learned from them what they've gone through and all of that, um, physical products, you've got that added issue of the logistics, the supply chain, the manufacturing, the compliance, uh, the, the inventory management, all of that, um, which makes it, I think, far more challenging than a service business. But for which, I, I mean, I, I think service businesses are more interesting for me because they're a lot more simple, but they also are a lot harder to, to scale at some point, I think. Yeah. So you were saying that you would like to take this company public. Is there anything that would change your mind and make you consider selling it? This becomes interesting because I have two partners in this venture and we're all at very different stages in life. One of my partners is turning 60 this year. He's got six grandkids, right? He's Mormon. He was brought up Mormon. He's no longer. And not that that matters, but it's just, it's a reproduction hub. So he's got five kids and they're starting to have grandkids. So he's at a, he's at a whole different place where he's incredibly risk adverse. So he actually wants to hold on to the business as almost an annuity because he looks at it like, gosh, where it sits now, it's very predictable. Um, man is incredibly intelligent. He's, he's really, really brilliant. But as we get into some, some microeconomic theory, it, it gets a little fuzzy for him where, right, we're still in the early adoption curve. So we haven't seen the, the compression in margins yet where we keep trying, you know, traipsing along, but the odds of us keeping 40% or more net income is pretty low, right? As we keep growing and more competitors come in the space, that's going to get whittled down. And so I have him, I have the second partner 
who is 45, never had kids, doesn't want kids, never been married, who's a free spirit. Who's like, man, I'll cash out tomorrow, whatever. I'm going to go surf and hang out and travel the world and hang out on a beach. And he's, he's more the creative. He's more the, the free freestyle type of guy. Then there's me, right? I'm 38. I, I look at this as the first step in a three act play for me, where whatever I do with this company, whatever we do with this company ends up being the on-ramp to the next big thing for me. I don't know what the next big thing is going to be. It's not, I'm not looking to get out of what I'm in now. It's just the acknowledgement that, okay, there's a lot of lessons from 5 million to, I don't know, maybe 150 million. If, if I were to show you our forecast for next year, it's, a, it's 125 million without acquisitions, two acquisitions kind of hovering in the background. So I think we'll hit 150 in, in total, total revenue as a business. Right, that 150 mark, it's, it's tough to, sh- to say. I mean, the, the logical side of me would say, Sean, we should sell to a private equity group with a good track record. We'll sell 70% of the business to them. We'll maintain 30%. They're going to, private equity groups have like a 92%, 98% success rate over the past 10 years of picking winners. Like they're not going to invest in something like us to let it flounder. So they're going to grow it exponentially over the next three or four years. And then they'll probably take a public where if they grow it enough in that three to four years, that 30% we hold on to, if they were to take a public, is worth as much as the 70% we sold this year. So that would be my preference is is to approach it that way because there's a lot I I would like to learn from some really sophisticated private equity groups. I don't know that I want to be the CEO of a publicly traded company. I don't know that having an answer to a true board of directors and all the nuances that go into that, I don't know that's a good fit for my personality at this point in time. But I don't know because I haven't been through it before either. It's one of those things of what's important to me is to return shareholder value to everybody that supports us. I want to make sure that, again, that janitor where we, our stock issuance was based off an enterprise value of $150 million. And our enterprise value is significantly higher than that at this moment. So some of these people that have, you know, two years of annual salary in in stock that they're holding on to, they're going to walk away with life-changing money from the decisions that we make. And that's really, really exciting to me. It's like, Sean, I think you and I probably a lot of the same boat. Money is certainly a motivator. It it gets me up in the morning. I'm excited by it. And I haven't had a a nine figure payday before. So I have to also raise my hand to that, right? I haven't had a hundred million dollar check in my hand personally before ever in my life, but it's, it's almost bigger than that now. Like the company is bigger. When I look at the 88 or so full-time employees we have, like I'll have a whole bunch more at bats from 39 until I'm done working where the line worker, right? That this might just be his trajectory for the rest of his life. He might just kind of, you know, line worker to, to team lead to maybe, you know, assistant manager is his entire career trajectory. So he puts four or five, six years of annual salary in his pocket. And if it's invested the right way, he's now completely changed the course of his life forever. Now, a lot of ifs there. It's also assuming that someone gets that five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar paycheck in their hand. They don't go out and buy new Rolls Royce and take their family on a couple of private jet flights and it's all gone. But I can't be responsible for all that. Do you guys offer like a, a 401k or an HSA or, a, uh, you know, an IRA plan that you match? We do. So I've taken a very employee centric view into our business, whereas I started looking at our net margin. And saying, okay, as, as an LLC, we're forty-seven percent of our income is is literally going to the federal government, and I believe we should all pay our fair share. Right? So that's no big deal. But if I'm gonna, if that money's already gone anyways, how else could I deploy it so it benefits more people than just who the government decides? And so it started with getting just the absolute best health insurance we could find. I mean, we we called brokers and said, just max out the best coverage on a national basis you can possibly find, and then we're going to pay for one hundred percent of it as an employer. So our employees have no medical expense. They have their deductible, but their deductible is very, very low, $250. And that covers them. And then we pay 20% of their families. So if they want to extend it, like we literally do everything we can to pay all the health insurance for our employees. Then we get a dollar matching, right? And we do have a 401k. Um, it's good, but any 401k is only so good. So we dollar match up to 4%. But we also have a, a financial advisor that works inside of kind of inside of our organization to help people truly understand that we pay for this individual to help people understand what they actually want to achieve. And is a 401k, the most effective vehicle for them to do that, or should they consider an IRA? Should they consider, you know, uh, any other litany 
uh, of products out there in the in the marketplace. Then we've went as far as, but I, I think health and wellness is a vital part of how we show up as employers, right? Am I am I saying I want my employees and my my team to be healthy and be happy, or do I actually live that? So we we do uh, we pay up to one hundred dollars per month for gym memberships for all of our employees. We we provide two meals a day from healthy meal prep companies that they can come and eat, you know, two meals a day that are shipped in. We have DEXA scans done for them. They get to, to work with nutritionists and dietitians to, to give them between that and that $1,250 a quarter in continuing education. We really want to create this environment where you're excited to come to work. You have fringe benefits that are way outside what makes quote unquote sense to most people and that you get the impression that we actually care about you. Because to me, if, if you feel like I care about you, because I generally do, but if you feel it, then you can actually feel it versus just hear it. And you're supported in growing as a person. I see that people just produce more. And so our what we're doing now is shortening down the workday, kind of counterintuitive to what everybody else does. Um, by quarter four of 2023, no one will be able to work more than six and a half hours a day, but it's deemed full-time work. So we're shaving things back more and more because there's been enough research now conducted that in between five and a half and six and a half hour workdays are kind of max productivity where, right, it's what the Parkinson's principle, things fill the time that you allot for them. And so as I'm monitoring people's, uh, I'll call it efficiencies, they're not efficient, right? They're involved in meetings they don't need to be involved in. They're wasting time at the water cooler. I'm like, hold on, why would you, you spend more time with your family? I think you can get everything done coming in at 10 and leaving at four. How great would that be if you didn't have to fight rush hour on either side? You got to spend more time with your family. And it's, it's, to me, it's counterintuitive until you zoom back and you're like, it's not really counterintuitive. It's how it should be. Like we've got into this hustle grind mentality, at least in the US, that 12, 14, 16 hour days have to happen in order for you to be successful. And there might've been a season for that for us, but I think we're way past that season. Right, we're we're just a more mature, mature company right now. That sounds like all the things that I was hoping my startup would do but we never got to a point where we could afford to do that, which was a shame because I had written it into everyone's contracts that they would be getting these things um, once we got that next raise. You know, once we, we raised that five million, that ten million, whatever it was, and um, we never got there. But uh, it was it was there, you know, and I sold people on that. You know, as one of the reasons to join us because that's what I was working towards, and uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. And yeah, it, it sounds more like a, a European kind of socialist uh, method of work, but in but in a good way because America does a great job of making socialism look like communism, which is ridiculous because they're not even close to one another. It's funny you share this, Sean, because I have a saying inside of our business that it's it's our responsibility to protect democracy, just not practice it. Where at some point, as an as an owner, it is a level of dictatorship, like. It's compiling information, but it's making decisions. And sometimes those decisions get made in the opposite manner that the team that supports me hopes the decisions get made. But they have to rally around it. And you look at socialism, just as you said, socialism is this beautiful construct, this beautiful idea if everyone's contributing and taking equally. To me, it's when there's disproportionate amounts of contribution versus, versus receiving, where because of the ecosystem that we've built, it's pretty, it's pretty balanced. Right, people people get to give and take from the system at a pretty equal level. I can't say that the, the CFO is taking more or less than the line worker. They're they're just both maximizing their own level of productivity and efficiency, creating a, a, a hybrid socialist environment that I think is a at scale will be a really cool thing to see. But all this sounds like I'm I'm sharing with you highlights. I'm not sharing with you the frustration, the kicking and screaming, the people not understanding, the people waiting. Like we could hop on a car right now with we could randomly call 20 employees and they're going to all say, yeah, I'm waiting for the rug to be pulled out from underneath me. I'm waiting for all this stuff to be told it's all fake because you also have the thing that most of our employees have worked for many other people who have promised them the world before and then decided the bottom line was more important than the world they promised them. And it's like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to run our business at that point that we have to worry that much about the bottom line without worrying that much about the people, which is great in this margin rich environment we're in now. But also make no mistake, if our margin kept getting compressed, the money would have to come from somewhere, right? It's like, where, where do you start cutting as, as an employer? Fringe benefits, too much staff, 
all the extra pieces and parts, which just get natural to me at a certain point, which then is the opposite, of course, of the socialistic environment that kind of wish to, that we aspire to, to live within. Is there anything else we haven't talked about that you'd like to mention as we come to a close here? I could sit on my soapbox for another couple hours and share things that, that have been lessons. I don't know if there's something actually that I, that I wish to share about business. To me, it's, it's more about life. And that's, I've noticed inside of my trajectory that how I do one thing ends up being how I do most things, if not everything. And so if I find myself, you talk about those four legs, right? The marketing, operation, sales, and service. I also look at us as human beings as having those, those same four legs, right? There's a component to our spirituality, whatever that means to you, whether it's a deity or whatever it is that you adhere to. There's the body, the physical vessel we walk around in. There's the relationships in our life, right? Friends, family, partners, whatever you want to look at. And there's this monetary side. And as entrepreneurs, it gets pretty easy to get folks on the money side and start looking around and saying, my quality of life is, is trash, right? I'm not taking care of my body the right way. My personal relationships are suffering. I don't know what I believe anymore from, from a, a deity type of perspective. And what I found is if I try to keep those a little bit in alignment as they're all growing, it makes life more enjoyable to live. And that's really, to me, so much of what I've caught myself as this, this guy that like, I'm an A-type personality. I want to achieve everything. I want to explore everything. I want to, I want to see how far I can push the envelope on every capacity. It's what happens when I slow down for a minute. What happens when it's the opposite of push? What happens when I sit there for a second and say, man, what, what's the highest version of Ryan doing right now? And if it's not what I'm doing, then it's my responsibility to get to that version really, really quickly. And quite often that version isn't 12 hour work days and coming down on somebody for not producing. It's showing empathy and compassion and understanding and realizing that to me, most of, most of life to me is just a mirror of an internal state of reality. And so if things are in flux around me, it means something's probably in flux inside of me that I need to look at first before trying to knock down walls with my fist over and over again. I learned living in Asia that lesson. It took a few years where I used to like yell basically if like I, I asked for something from like a bank, right? For example, like, uh, like I lost my bank card and I needed another one. Oh, well, you know, it'll be ready in 14 days. Well, I'm sorry, but like I need to spend my money like right now, you know, so I would get mad if, if like I, I didn't get my way basically. Like what? This is ridiculous. Why would you make people wait for it? Like, and then over time I started to realize like yelling at this person isn't going to change the fact that they're just the person at the front of the bank who can't make that decision. That's the policy. They have no control over it. But if I'm sweet to them, maybe they know someone above them and maybe that person can give me a better answer or or that person can give me better, whatever it is. So it, it took me a few years because I was so used to being so, you know, I came to China when I was very young. I was so used to the American way of like things are very efficient and it requires a tremendous amount of patience and maturity to recognize that most other countries just aren't as efficient as America. And if you want to live in those other places, you got to just shut up and deal with it or find a smart way around it. What I'm hearing you say is if you're, if you're listening to Sean and I and you haven't traveled the world, you probably need to a little bit. Or you start seeing how the rest of the world operates, like going to Italy and seeing like at 2 p.m., there is nothing happening. Like everybody's taking a break. They're, they're drinking, they're eating, they're having conversations. They might head back to work at four. It might be five. They might not head back at all. Like it is just a whole different balance and, and seeing that even if it's not a life you wish you adhere to, just to see how many ways different cultures operate and like Italy's GDP per capita is, is still incredibly appropriate, right? It's not, they're not an impoverished state. They're not going backwards. They've figured out a way to make it work where part of what I'm going through right now is questioning who's thinking and my thinking, like the thoughts that have made me a success, like whatever level of success I've achieved now those same thoughts won't get me to the next level of success. I can't think harder. I can't work harder to get to the next place. I have to think differently. And that's really a big shift for me is like reading another 30 books isn't going to get me to this next place. It's reading one book 30 times to pull out the, the 20 or 30 incremental nuggets and actually seeing them apply and change my thinking will help pro progress me that way. And going to 30 different countries. That's exactly right. Like Bali. Well, Bali's not a country, but yes, because you were talking about Indonesia before, so I was thinking like you you were thinking 
what's the the highest version of Ryan doing? It's not working harder. Yeah, it's sitting on a beach in Bali. Absolutely, it is. Feedback, Serenata. Knowing there's a manufacturing facility that I could hop in a car and drive to or rickshaw, perfect. But then not. Never, <laughs> never stepping foot in there. Having a video, having a screen on my phone where I can just confirm that things are happening. Or just not having a phone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you keep challenging me because you're correct. But oddly enough, Sean, in this moment, that doesn't speak to me right now. Like it, I can see a version of myself that wants to live that way. It's just really far down the road. I feel like there's so much more to achieve. There's so much more to explore. There's so much more to, to see what I'm capable of. That that feedback, no responsibility, like that is my seventh plane of hell right now would be that. That would be like pulling my hair out, going crazy with there's so much stuff I can do. So maybe you can help me work on that as I progress forward. When I was younger, I used to travel through Asia for a month at a time, two months at a time where I wasn't doing business yet. And so I didn't have any work I could do at the time. So I would literally have a month of just nothing, just like actually having fun doing nothing. I tried like two days off in a row and I was like, what the hell am I doing with myself now? Like now it's totally different. Now I, I can't take a month, but um, it was good. I, I remember those days fondly for sure. Those are days I have yet to experience. So I look forward to those in, the, in the, the later seasons of my life. So how can people follow up? Pretty simple. It's just Ryan Nidell, R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L. And that's .com for my website. It's every social platform. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's all the same. Um, maybe great part, maybe not so great part. Don't have anything to sell you. Don't have any wares to hawk for you. If you sign up for a mailing list, you just get Tuesday, Thursday correspondence of things that I'm working on that might help you. Uh, it's just a way for me to, to really document my own journey and be able to look back and say, man, that was a either a really profound thought I had in the middle of January of 2023 or, man, what an idiot. What a horrible thing to share with the world. So if you're curious about stuff like that, what I'm up to, what I'm working on, any of those platforms will clue you in. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate it. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're looking to build your business past $5 million a year, it's a very difficult journey that will take a long time. But if you can figure out exactly what it is that's preventing you from growing and you can fix it as quickly as possible, then maybe you'll get there a little bit faster. Thank you, Ryan.